in Flanders fields and in France. Where Australians fought and fell, an idea formed in the mind of a witness to their hell, of how and where to remember them. Charles Bean, as official uh, war correspondent, had formed this view that there should be this memorial. Where it was to be, in his mind, was in the heart of the nation, and that became his mission statement and made him aware that these things had to be preserved. There had to be a memory of what these men had gone through to be preserved in Australia. In 1917, the Australian War Records section was set up, marking the birth of the memorial. War artists were dispatched to the battlefields. Diggers were told to collect relics. There are photos in the collection of uh, men wearing the helmets that they had souvenired, the Pickelhaube helmet, the German spiked helmet that they'd souvenired from prisoners or from uh, in the course of battle. Men waving these, these helmets and uh, wearing them proudly after a battle. The word souvenir evolved from their efforts. The diggers scrounged everything from the very small to the very, very large. Nothing was too big for them to send home. Over the course of the war, some 25,000 items were gathered, along with these, the collection of the records, the actual official war records of the, the operational records of the units, the divisions, and of the AIF, and finally the Australian Corps as it became. Those records at the end of the war amounted to 21 and a half million force cap sheets something that would occupy Charles Bean for the next 20 odd years of his life in writing the official history. Construction started in 1929, was interrupted by the Great Depression and only completed in 1941. There's something uniquely Australian about this building, even though it's modelled on perhaps Byzantine, Egyptian forms, the huge fortress base and the open big parapet pylons at the front. The dome itself, many have said, is reminiscent of uh, Hagia Sophia in uh, Istanbul. So it even has a bit of a Byzantine uh, edge to it, but it, it remains uniquely Australian. Here, with all the colour of this essentially Australian panorama encircling it, no more beautiful or fitting position could have been chosen. Surely, they whose memory is enshrined in this hallowed place they feel they have come home again. Australia gave unsparingly, ungrudgingly, the best and the bravest of our young manhood. And it is in their honour that this memorial has been erected. I have now the honour to declare the Australian National War Memorial open. A mecca towards which in the years, nay, the centuries to come, Australians will travel to absorb the imperishable story it has to tell. The dioramas, striking combinations of sculptor and artist, present vivid, almost living fragments of the war. The dioramas unveiled at the 1941 opening have been beautifully restored in the new gallery. In August 1918, the second Australian division in three days of furious and brilliant fighting against the Prussian guard carried the height of Mount St. Quentin commanding the town of Perron, which itself was taken by the 5th Division. Diorama shows the 6th Brigade about to resume the attack from Elsa Trench. Webb Gilbert's sculpture is filled with superb action. Historian Peter Burness has worked at the memorial and walked its galleries for 43 years. One event right here in the World War I space is seared into his memory. We had 250 Gallipoli veterans, uh, pretty much representing any Gallipoli veteran still alive who could make the trip to Canberra. You know, to see these old veterans, the, the last living reminders of the Gallipoli campaign, and who were so proud and determined to be here that day, is something I think lives in the memory of all of us who were present.
one image that stands out in my mind is one of the old veterans wanting to go to look at the roll for his battalion and seeing the names of men he knew and pointing them out to us with his, his walking stick. You could see they were tremendously proud and wanting to be involved, but it was also a great day out for them, you know, to be with cobbers and, and, and to relive those, those times. OK, fine. Thank you very much. I felt really proud of myself. And uh, I was highly honoured to think I was invited to come in. And it's nice to think that everyone hasn't forgotten you. We're <laughs> proud to have seen you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a truly historic and emotional day for Australia. The digger who, for 75 years, has lain alongside his mates in France after falling in battle is home. <laughs> This bearer party has accompanied this body all the way from Villa Bretonneau. Now the coffin is being borne aloft. It will go into the domed part of this Australian war memorial. He has been returned to his land. We honour his service. We place his remains to rest in this sacred place. Mr. Hayden places the wattle. Now with him is Bob Coombe. He's a digger from here in Canberra, from the Canberra suburb of Griffith. And he's sprinkling some very special soil from Pozier upon this coffin. We will remember them. 75 years on, our digger, our mate, is home. From the Second World War, some relics came home under their own steam. Yes, G for George is an old war horse of the skies, and the nearer you get, the bigger he looks. Each bomb sign on the fuselage represents a combat mission. G for George spent a lot of time over G for Germany. When Anzac Hall opened, G for George became part of a fully immersive experience. A stunning reenactment of that of what a bombing run for the crew involved, using the voices, the original recorded voices from the cockpit. Bomb doors open. Right steady, hold it. The sounds of the bombing, the sounds of the air assault by fighters, the anti-aircraft fire, the flak. The other very new trait was given to us by Peter Jackson, the uh, celebrated filmmaker. Once again, spectators who are there are in the air with the pilots. They're experiencing the whole onslaught of, uh, of aerial dogfights of, of that war at its highest pitch of intensity. Now, look at the helicopter over here. That's a machine gun. The memorials become a place of learning and a place of healing. We have a responsibility to them to tell their story, not years or decades after it's happened, but we have to tell it now. I can still see Frankie drinking tinnies. If we'd the told the story of the Vietnam the War broadly and deeply in the late 70s and early 80s at the Australian War Memorial, some of those men might not have suffered quite as much as they have. And the Anzac legends didn't mention Martin I will never forget the palpable emotion of those men and women in that hall of memory in front of the unknown Australian soldier hearing John Schumann deliver the song of their generation. I was only 19. Former professional SAS through to then young conscripts, nurses, just absorbing it 
and knowing that the nation was saying to them, very belatedly, we are proud of you and we thank you. The Afghanistan exhibition that we have, of which we are very proud, Afghanistan, the Australian story, it's important their story's being told. And it's being told in ways that are compelling and meaningful, not only for them and their families, but for the rest of us. One naval officer wrote to me and said, thank you for telling my 11-year-old son in words that I never could why his father has spent so much time away. You read about it in books and you see it in TV shows and on movies where someone opens the door and there are men and women there in uniform, but to actually have it happen, I, I can't even put it into words. The Australian War Memorial is many things. But one of them is that it is a part of the therapeutic milieu. To know the Australian War Memorial, to know not the building, nor the artefacts and relics and exhibits within it, is one thing. But to know the stories of the men and women behind it, from the First World War to Afghanistan and everything in between, is to understand Australia. <laughs>